Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to worship. It's wonderful to have you here. We apologize for the elevator being out of service. Uh, we'll make sure to let you know as soon as it's working again. We're hopeful that it'll be up and running for next Sunday. If your uh, part, your group is gathering in our church building this week, be aware that the elevator uh, will probably not be functioning until later on in the week. Whether you are, are gathering with us here or you're gathering with us at home, we welcome you and we trust that our worship together will be uh, uh, pleasing to you, but most importantly, pleasing to God as we gather. Now, we have a few things coming up. Uh, first, uh, Spring Fling. June 4th and 5th will be our Spring Fling this year. We are going to be going to Spring Waters Conservation Area to the old schoolhouse. We are going to gather on Saturday the 4th at 3. We're going to have activities for youth and adults. Uh, we're going to have dinner at 6, I believe, and then a time of fellowship and gathering through the evening and a campfire. And then for those of you who wish to camp there or will be camping there, you'll be camping the night away. Uh, taking the 2, 2 a.m. break there where you wake up and you make your way. To <laughs> and then uh, on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. we will gather to worship together in an outdoor service, um, depending on what the weather is like. Uh, but we're, we're, we're hopeful. It's going to be a wonderful weather. So all of that's being planned. You need to fill out a registration form first, uh, uh, though, so we know what we need to provide in terms of uh, finances to, to Springwater for the registration. Um, just really quickly here, uh, it's $10 per person, 20 per family, uh, 30 per family if you're camping. Um, there's a list of things you should probably be taking with you so that you have it for that, uh, that time as well. So you can get this uh, either in your ABC Connect newsletter or there are also hard copies of the registration form at the back um, of the, um, just outside the sanctuary in the narthex. And then once again, if you look in your pews, you will see this little form that I'm new or I'd like to update my information. If you have information to update about your, your new cell phone number or the, whatever address changes you might have, this is information that's helpful to us. It allows us to text you if we know that your phone number is a cell phone number. If you let, know, uh, let us know whose cell phone number it is, we're less likely to text your better half or your uh, as a by mistake, so um, so that that's uh, more information for you there. Let us pray. Oh God, you are uh, an all-powerful, all-consuming, gracious, loving, just God. No matter how hard we try, oh God, we can't put you in a box. You, you, you overwhelm us. Even our, our greatest expectations for you can't be realized or even envisioned. You are our strength, our hope. You are the mystery that gives meaning to life. draw near to us, transcends these earthly limitations and reveal yourself to us through your Holy Spirit and through your word to us. May we experience you in this place through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
we gather in prayer. And um, we did that last week, and we did that the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. And sometimes when we do it week after week after week, it becomes rather routine for us. Um, we know at this point we're going to close our eyes, and we're going to listen to the minister say words, and some are going to be meaningful to us, and some not so much. And in the best moments of our time of prayer, we are going to sense God present with us. And God is present with us whether we sense her or not. When we gather together as this church is gathered now, and as you who are gathered online, we are bowing our heads and closing our eyes and speaking words that we believe express our heart. But we do so knowing that we are not alone. It is not a monologue. God is with us. Amidst the routine of our time in prayer, May we be mindful that what we do here in our time of prayer is not even the most miraculous part, but rather that the God of the universe is listening and responding. Let us pray. <coughs> <coughs> Gracious God, Enable us to sense your spirit among us. Quiet our hearts long enough that we might sense your presence with us. <laughs> There are many things we long to say to you. We long to offer prayers of thanksgiving. We are thankful for the life we live in your presence. We confess, oh God, that sometimes it's hard to face you. Sometimes we, we just want to hide from you. We, we don't feel ready for an intimate encounter with you. It, it, it feels um, overwhelming. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit that enable, uh, enables us and challenges us and prods us to keep this conversation going. Even when we've failed you and we're not sure how to make things right again. Even when we're angry with you and we just want you to go away. Even when we, 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 we are tempted to embrace the easy answers of the world because your mystery is difficult to understand. Hear us, O oh God, when we approach you. When we close our eyes, when we bow our heads, when we lift up our heads to the heavens, 
comfort us with your presence. Hear us as we speak. Bring your will to bear upon us and transform us. Hear our silent prayers now, O God, as we lift up the needs of those who are dear to our hearts this day. Lord, hear our prayers for the sake of those who we are trying to avoid because they make us uncomfortable. Lord, hear our prayers as we lift up our deepest fears in the hope of peace and comfort through you. O oh Lord, open our hearts that we might receive the salvation you offer to us through Jesus our Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Let us continue in our songs. This morning is taken from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him, in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, 
so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Thanks be to God. Let me begin with a public service announcement. Never take a starburst just before the prayer time. (laughs) Oh, there you go. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. I swallowed my own, uh, yeah. went in the wrong, wrong end. Well, We're into week three in our series on the body of Christ. And over the past two weeks, we've been exploring the body of Christ as a metaphor for the church. It's a metaphor that Paul uses in several of his letters. And while uh, Paul doesn't usually say uh, the body of Christ is the church, he does often tell the church he's writing to that they are the body of Christ. He does so with the church in Corinth and in the church in Rome and in the church in Colossae and in the church in Ephesus. Now, two weeks ago we explored 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and its focus on the importance of the members of the body. We who are members of the body. The focus is on the fact that there is one body and yet many members and all those members are different. We have hands and feet and ears and eyes. And we all belong to that body. And we are all needed in order for that body to function effectively. Then last week in Ephesus chapter 4, we we focused on the ligaments of the body. And I I made the, the suggestion that these ligaments are intended to hold and support the members of the body, to enable them to function together as efficient and effective joints, bringing members together to work cooperatively. We talked about apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Well, this morning we turn our attention to the head of the body. And the head, he, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Son, is described in our passage as the head of the body of the church. And just read that for us. Now, you may have noticed that we talk about the body of Christ rather than the body of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, our passage from two weeks ago, <clears throat> we read, now, now you are the body of Christ, and each one is part of it. Each one of you is part of it. And likewise, last week in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, we were reminded that the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and teachers were given by Christ to equip the people for the work of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. And in our passage this morning, the the verses that preceded in the opening chapter of Colossians describe the Son of God as Jesus Christ. And it is the Son, God's Son, that is being described in our passage. Now, I mention all of this and the semantics of seeing the church as the body of Christ or the body of Jesus because I believe it matters. It affects the way we understand ourselves as a church. 
I think it affects the way we exist as a church, even here in Elmer. Let me explain. Generally, when we speak of Jesus, our minds and our thoughts are generally drawn to Jesus of the Gospels. This Jesus who we can identify with. The one who is tempted as we are, yet without sin. The Son of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. We're drawn to his teachings and his mission. When we think of this Jesus of Nazareth, we, we, we think of the, the, the historical Jesus. The one who was born and lived and walked this earth and taught us and then was crucified and died and was buried and then rose again. When we talk of Jesus, we're drawn to his teachings the great commandment, love God and love your neighbor. The great commission of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where we're told to go out and make disciples of all, nature, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. We're, we see ourselves in this Jesus we can identify with him. We long to be like him. We look to this Jesus and we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Now you might have to be old to be able to get this reference, but I remember when I was young, we used to sing a song in youth group. It was uh, written by Linda Rich. Uh, back in 1969 and it was called The Man of Galilee and the chorus went like this I want to be like I want to hear like I want to see like The Man of Galilee I want to talk like I want to walk like I want to be like The Man of Galilee it speaks of our aspiration to be like Jesus of Galilee. And it inspires us as a church to strive to do likewise. We say as much in our church vision statement, don't we? We aspire, we, uh, we aspire, to, we aspire to walk in love and lead Christ-inspired lives. However, when we think of Jesus being the head of the church, we tend to see ourselves, the church, primarily as the hands and feet of Jesus. Last week's video, at the introduction of the service, uh, that video was entitled, uh, this is church. And in one portion of it near the end, it says, the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go. Hands do. This is the church. When we see the church as the body of Jesus of Nazareth, <coughs> we long to be an extension of Jesus' work and ministry. This Jesus who walked the earth and modeled what it means to be fully human in this world as disciples of God, following in the example of Jesus. And thus we see the church as doing stuff Jesus would do if he were still here on earth. 
coordinating our efforts and deploying us into the world. The head of his church. Sending forth missionaries into our neighborhoods to do what Jesus did and what Jesus would do. But if we're not careful, we can come to see ourselves as primarily a gathering of believers seeking to undertake acts of benevolence and social justice. Like Jesus would do. Like so many other charitable organizations, we can begin to see ourselves as a benevolent organization, striving to help the poor and the widow and the orphan, <clears throat> and where we can speak out for justice and offer opportunities for like-minded folk to gather. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's all good stuff. The church and we, its members, are intended to serve as the hands and feet of Jesus. But the church is so much more than that. For the church is not merely an extension of the body of Jesus. We are the body of Christ. And may I suggest to you, there is a difference. When we talk about Jesus as the Christ, we proclaim that Jesus was not only the Son of God who came to dwell among us, but that this Jesus Christ is also God the Son as well. Jesus the Christ not only walked the earth for 33 plus years, was crucified, buried, and rose again, but also this same Christ existed before creation and continues to reign following his resurrection and ascension. And this Christ, God the Son, is still active among us now. This is why in our time of prayer, I, I sought to enable us to walk in that truth. We are not the most important part of the church. For the Christ is the head of the church. And as the head of the church, Christ is among us. Our passage this morning from Colossians chapter 1 declares the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body the church. When we see Christ as the head of the church, we are suddenly talking about, about much more than being the hands of Jesus. Like us, uh, the Canadian Baptists of Ontario and Quebec have a, a mission statement. It describes itself as follows. A family of churches transformed by Christ, revealing God's kingdom. Yes, we are the hands and feet of Jesus, but we are also a community transformed by Christ, revealing God's kingdom. 
When we gather as a church, whether it be five or ten or a hundred or a thousand strong, we exist as revealers of God's kingdom, witnesses to what God is doing and will continue to do in our midst. We bear witness to the reality of the living God, and we point people to the one who is the head of the body of the church. I think the Orthodox Church has this right. Has anybody ever been to an Orthodox service? It's boring. <laughs> really boring and really long. In your Orthodox service, uh, I, I'll speak from my son's Greek Orthodox Church, the service begins when the first deacon comes in with, to use, to change the metaphor into our context, when the deacons arrive with the bag of bread. They don't come in with the bag of bread until there are people in the pews to bear witness to the fact that God is here and Christ is present. And then they go in and they, they get the wine out and they set the table and they get the host ready and they get the wine ready. This whole time the service is going on. Nothing's happening. You're just watching this happen. Half of the service happens be, be, behind the wall of the icons. You can't see a thing. You just see them walk in the door and then walk out the door. There's chanting going on and you're participating with your singing. It's all in Koine Greek, the old Greek, not even the Greek they speak today. You have to pay attention because every time you hear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit spoken in Greek, you have to do this three times. And you participate. And you stand and you sit and you stand and you listen to the chants and you watch and all that. Three hours later, you get a chance to participate in communion and make your way home. We're not talking Easter here where you start the night before and you go all the way to the next day and there are people all along. But all of that is happening. Why? Because the people sitting in the pew are not the people who are being focused on or entertained or taught. The service is about God. If God is here, shouldn't we spend a little bit of time, maybe even most of our time, recognizing that God is here? Of course, there's a sermon, there's a homily. Of course, there's an opportunity for things we enjoy. There's fellowship. We get to participate of the body and, and, and blood of Christ and communion. But at no time in an orthodox service do you get the sense that they're going out of their way to think about you in the pews. You are bearing witness to something far greater than you, you can imagine. The living God the image of the invisible God has gathered you together to acknowledge that you are part of this kingdom which is being revealed in real time. Oh yeah. When you talk about the church as the body of Christ, we were talking about something far greater than being the hands and feet of Jesus. You are the hands and feet of Jesus, yes. But so much more than that. You are members of the body of Christ. But God wants you here far more than for your skills and your ideas. In fact, there, there's no idea you could come up with, no brilliant re, revitalization idea you can come up with that is going to succeed 
unless God decides it does. And you might even think you're being successful, only to discover that you've gone down a rabbit hole, that the world thinks is successful, but inevitably breaks God's heart. The head of the body is not Jesus Christ who walked the talk, Jesus of Nazareth who walked the talk, but rather Jesus the Christ who points us to God and embodies God for us. He is the Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, the one in whom all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all creation was formed for his benefit. And he was a participant in all of that. When we worship Christ and when we participate in the body of Christ, we participate in the work of God revealed in Jesus Christ who existed before Jesus of Nazareth was born into the world and continues to reign following his ascension. When we gather to worship, to pray, to eat a meal together, to socialize, outside these walls as followers of Jesus Christ. When we strive to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this broken world, we are participating in and revealing the kingdom of God. We are pointing people to Jesus the Christ who makes the kingdom of God visible to those with eyes to see. We acknowledge that our perspective on life and the world is different from others because we live in the midst of this cosmic reality, this mystery that is beyond understanding, and we have come to be comfortable knowing that there are things we will never master or know or fully understand because we live in a kingdom of mystery. We recognize that the things that matter are under Christ's control and the things that Christ is not holding together don't really matter in the long term. We celebrate the reconciliation we experience in Jesus Christ made possible through his shed blood on a cross for us. We rejoice in the knowledge that Jesus the Christ is the head of the body of the church and we are part of that as well. Christ is the head of the body, not me, not you, not grandma, not grandpa, not my great-great-great-grandpa, not my favorite pastor, pastor present, but Christ Jesus the Lord. We, the church, are not merely a benevolent social club or a charitable organization or even a gathering of light-minded believers trying to be relevant. At different times, we can be all of that. But ultimately, we are revealers of God's kingdom as we participate in that reality. We point others to Christ who is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, who is the Son of God, who is the Word of flesh, made flesh, who is the head of the church, who is the source of all good things. 
If any of our efforts, our ministries, our brilliant ideas find success, it's because Christ has made it so. For he is the head of the church. And what a privilege to know that this ministry, this church, this place where a glimpse of God is revealed does not depend on us. Because there's something far greater going on right now. Let us pray. Well, gracious God, we, we, we gather in your midst and we long to serve you. We long to be the church in this place. And we've learned to be the church by watching others, by growing up in this place, by, by bringing our, our understanding of church from other places. And, and we long to make a positive contribution to the ministry that you, to which you have called us. But open our eyes, O oh God, that we might see Christ in our midst. And that in our growing, we may be striving to reveal your kingdom and proclaiming in our lived life and worship who this Christ is as he reveals you, O oh God to us and to the world around us. Bless us. Inspire us. Embrace us. As we worship you. And God the Son. The head of the church. Amen. for the next week a much needed time of rest and, and enjoyment we will miss you and we uh, uh, look forward to your return in a couple of weeks as you go out to the world uh, be mindful that you are the church in that you bring a great message of Jesus Christ into the world but even more than that Christ, the revealer of God, journeys with you. And thus God is always to be found. 
All you need to do is look and listen. So go out into the world as disciples of Jesus Christ and followers of God. And may you be blessed in your ministry. Amen.